All right, wonderful students, let's get to it. It is Friday, and welcome to Classics 160 D2 Classical Mythology. And today's lecture is 6.3 on Athena and Aeschylus' Eumenides and the final research project, all these wonderful things. Let's see what we got on the docket for today. All right, it all begins with announcements, recap, you know the deal there. Uh, then I was thinking about it. I kind of had to rush through what I was doing with the Panathenaic Festival on Wednesday. So I'd like to start today, maybe the first 15 minutes or so, and kind of cover that in a little bit more depth, right? So kind of rather than the really concise overview uh, or recap, really go into that in a little bit more depth. And we'll finish out talking about the, uh, the Athenian Acropolis. And then we've got a couple things on the docket brought to you by your wonderful, amazing TAs. Uh, Darcy will be talking about the final draft, right? So now that you guys have your first draft done, what's happening with the final draft? Uh, Julianne's going to talk about the final project that's at the end of the semester. Uh, Matt's going to give you a little history lesson, right? So one of the things we talked about is the reason we have all these incredible buildings on the Acropolis is because the Persians went through in 480 BC and burned everything down, right? So once Greece won that war, they were starting from a totally blank slate uh, in order uh, to rebuild the Acropolis, and, and that's where you get the Parthenon today. Um, and then we'll finish today uh, with a little bit about Aeschylus's Eumenides. And this is kind of the way I originally had the course set up was like readings every week. And I think somehow I made the reading for this Friday disappear. You definitely didn't have like outside of the research proposal. You didn't have anything. You didn't have like a normal reading response to. But I was going to have you read this, but I think it disappeared. But anyway, our wonderful TA Katie is going to talk a little bit about that um, and uh, the judgment of Athena at the end of this and talk a little bit about um, how with that we see the birth of, of uh, really formalized law in Athens uh, in the Archaic period. So let's go ahead and get to it. So announcements recap, you know the deal, right? Put it in speaker view, you can see me, you can see these wonderful, great notes here. Uh, email your TA or me or somebody who's not talking uh, if you've got a question. And congratulations to everybody on getting your uh, first draft of your proposal done, right? And we'll be talking to you um, over the next few weeks about where that's headed from here. Uh, and I promise you guys, and I promise the TAs, I am really in the process of trying to get together some really good examples uh, of previous projects so that you guys have a sense of like what an extraordinary project would look like. Okay, so on Wednesday, right, we were talking not just about Athena, but about kind of her impact on religious architecture in Athens in the ancient world, right? And nowhere is that better exemplified than the Acropolis in Athens, right? Right in the heart of Athens. Very literally, right? Acropolis, meaning the high Acropolis city, the, the high point of the city. And this is what it looks like if you send a drone up there today, right? You can see the Acropolis itself kind of jutting out of the heart of the city. And then what we have are we have four major buildings that are still left there, right? So you wind your way up here through the Propylaea, all right? So that's the monumental entranceway, the Propylaea, very, very literally the front gate. From there, on your way up, you're going to see this tiny little temple out on the right-hand side, just to your right. And that, of course, is the temple of Athena Nike, right? So a temple to Athena, but the victory version of Athena here. And uh, as you pass by that and you get into the heart of the Acropolis itself, you're going to see the Parthenon, right? That's by far the biggest structure uh, on the Acropolis. And again, the reason we call it the Parthenon is because it's dedicated to Athena Parthenos, right? The kind of virgin or the maiden form of the goddess Athena. And then what we've got, so there's our Parthenon, right? And what we've got in this final little structure over here, right? The, the really weirdly formed one, that's the Erechtheon. And we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of today um, and what's going on with that. So let's uh, go into a little bit more depth on the, uh, the Parthenon itself, right? In addition to kind of being able to identify the structure, we also were talking about the art 
and what that can reveal about Greek culture and then also Greek religious festivals, right? And so there were three different parts to the Parthenon that really have extensive artistic uh, elements. And the first one we talked about was the pediment. And the pediment, remember, is the triangular, right? Is the triangular area on the front and back of the temples. And when we look at what's on the pediment, anybody remember what it is? Let's see who the first person is. You can tell me both, both scenes on the, the Parthenon pediments. Let's see here. The winner is nobody. All right, Emma, you've got Birth of Athena. Drew, you've got Athena versus Poseidon. Those are the two big ones, right? The Birth of Athena, the contest for Athens. You guys got it. Very, very good. Uh, so we've got um, the contest between Poseidon and Athena for the patronage of the city of Athens. And then we've got the Birth of Athena, right? Busting out of the head. Of, uh, of Zeus himself with Hephaestus splitting it open with his Minoan double-bladed axe. All right, so next up, right, right under those pediments, uh, we see the triglyphs and metopes, right? And the triglyphs are those kind of three vertical lines. Again, scholars tend to think that these are uh, kind of remnants of when temples used to be made out of wood. Um, but now they're like carved in stone and they're more decorative. When they were wood, they actually would have been functional. And in between those triglyphs, we have metopes, right? That's the blank area. But on the Parthenon and on a number of other temples, you actually get these things decorated. And what we did on Wednesday is we looked at the decoration of all four sides of this, right? Um, so on the east side, we have the gigantomachy, right? Uh, so the battle between the Olympians and the giants where Heracles comes in to save the day. Um, on the south side, we've got the centauromachy, right? There's this big wedding uh, between um, uh, Pirithus um, and uh, Hippodamia, and the, the centaurs come. They drink wine for the first time. They get all drunk and start a big fight. Then we've got the Amazonomachy, right, between the Greeks and the Amazons and the Trojan War itself. Now, you don't need to... The, the big takeaway point from these, right, is not that you remember what every single side is, okay? You don't need to remember that the Centauromachy is on the south side of the Parthenon. What I do want you to remember is that all four of these sides, right, are representing uh, the Greeks kind of subduing elements of barbarism or chaos, right? What, what the, the Athenians are trying to do with their decorative element on the Metopes is show that their kind of level of civilization, Greek civilization, is able to kind of um, overcome and subdue uh, this kind of uncivilized barbarism of these different groups rent, uh, represented by uh, people like the Amazons or the Centaurs or the Giants. Okay, so we've talked about the pediments, right? We've talked about the metopes, uh, and now we're gonna talk about the frieze, which is like, once you get through the first row or first kind of part of the thing of columns on the Parthenon, there's a second one. And up above that second kind of set of columns, all around, what you end up seeing um, is a continuous sculptural program that's gonna tell the story of the Panathenaic Festival, right? So we've got the pediments and then the metopes right under there. And if you jump just inside of that, right, to the second row of columns, you'll see this continuous freeze, right? A continuous sculptural program all the way around. And from this sculptural program, we have some of the most like famous sculptures in the Greek world, right? Like these equestrian riders, you see them everywhere. Like all the Greek restaurants and stuff that put up their like uh, kind of fake Parthenon, like Greek sculptures and stuff like that, they all have like images like this in there. Um, and what this is doing again is showing how the Panathenaic Festival would have actually operated. Now, the Panathenaic Festival itself is like one of the greatest civic religious rituals, right? Rituals. And when I say civic, what I mean is that it's associated with a particular city state, right? So this is only for Athens, only for Athenians. Sparta would have had their own things, right? Corinth would have had its own things. Thebes had its own things. Um, so each of these city-states, right, are governed independently, and they all have their own religious festivals. So for Athens, the Panathenaea is the really big one. Now, there are actually two levels of this, right? 
So the greater Panathenaea, or the great Panathenaea, happens every four years. That's the really, really big one. And every other year, uh, the, you get what's known as the lesser Panathenaea, which is kind of a stripped down version of this. And what we see with this is it's not just one single thing, but rather a combination of things like rituals and sacrifices, athletic contests, music contests, poetry contests. So there's a bunch of different things uh, where the, the uh, citizens uh, of Athens get together, uh, compete with each other, celebrate the goddess, uh, and kind of bond among their kind of like civic, their kind of common Athenianness. And the point of the whole thing, right, or the kind of event that the whole thing is centered around is bringing what's known as the peplos, right, the Greek word for the garment that Athena wears, to the cult statue inside of the Parthenon. And what we can see here are some of the different um, components of what the festival would have uh, been comprised of, right? So there would have been athletic events. So you have these kind of uh, boat races, you've had chariot events, you get these things known as the apobates, where you get like charioteers like jumping off the chariot and then back onto the chariot. Think of it as like um, kind of like fancy horse riding, that sort of thing. Um, you've got musical competitions, flute competitions, right? Kithara, the predecessor to the guitar, those kind of competitions, singing competitions, poetry competitions. Um, and this would have all happened over the course of something like eight days. So here's one possible kind of reconstruction of the way that this would have worked, starting with musical comp uh, competitions, moving into the athletic competitions, finishing with the boat races, and then a big celebration at the end to award the prizes um, and a, kind of an accompanying feast. And one of the super cool things is what you're looking at over here is one of the prizes, right? Like we actually still have the like gold medal equivalents from the Panathenaic Games. And so these would have been a, an amphora, right? That's uh, one of the, the names for the, the form of the vase here, right? Um, and on one side, you have the goddess Athena, right? So she's there with her shield and her spear and her uh, helmet. And if you turn this thing around, you would have a depiction of the other side, uh, or you would have a depiction of whatever the event was, right? So if somebody won the foot race, then um, it would be a foot race on one side, Athena on the other side, and the whole thing would have been filled with olive oil. Now, what's really cool is when you walk around the Parthenon, right? Um, and you, you kind of look at the, the sculptural program, uh, you can see kind of the order in which things would have happened. So we see these equestrian riders kind of leading off, they occur by rank. Then that's followed by these charioteers kind of, again, jumping on and off the chariots. From there, we get uh, a bunch of people on foot, right? So we've got a lot of different people. Um, we've got old men carrying olive branches, again, sacred to the goddess. We've got musicians. We've got youth, uh, right, bringing jars of water and olive oil. Um, we've got people bringing grain baskets. So medics are the, the term for uh, people who are in Athens, but not necessarily citizens, right? So they're um, people who have come from somewhere else into Athens. And then we've got herdsmen, right? Bringing uh, animals like cattle here for sacrifice to the goddess. So all these things are following the, uh, the equestrian riders. And again, you can see kind of a, a, a recreation of what this would have looked like here. And then finally, right, after the horsemen and after the people on foot, you get the procession of the peplos itself, right? So again, the peplos is the garment. And so what you have here is you have women carrying uh, libation equipment, then you have the weavers, and then you have the presentation. And what that looks like, right, so we've got the weavers here, right? So the women who would have been weaving the peplos. We've got the peplos itself, right, being carried on somebody's head here and then folded up for the goddess. And then we have a recreation here, right? Kind of a drawing of the actual presentation to the Olympian gods, right? So we can see Zeus and Athena right at the center of this, uh, then the other Olympians kind of moving out from the center. And what we've got here is basically a recreation of the route that this would have taken. So you can actually go kind of recreate this from yourself, walking from the outside of the city, through the city, through the Agora, up the side of the Acropolis and onto the Acropolis itself in front of the Parthenon, um, you can still follow the, uh, the route today in Athens of the, uh, the original Panathenaic procession. 
So, again, once you get up there, uh, they're bringing this kind of giant monumental new dress for the goddess. And that's because when we think about the cult statues, right, when we think about the gods and goddesses in temples in Greek antiquity, they're kind of like living beings. You kind of have to treat them like living beings. You like have to feed them, right? That's kind of what sacrifices are. You have to clothe them. You burn incense to them. You sacrifice to them. Uh, and in return, right, they kind of uh, bless you, keep you protected, make sure crops are growing, all those wonderful things. So you can see it being brought in here on the, uh, the mast of a ship. And then you can also get a really rough sense for what this kind of might have looked like in antiquity, because even though the Parthenon is like bright white today, in antiquity, a lot of those decorative elements would have been painted, would have been very, very colorful. And then inside, what we have is the statue of Athena herself, right? The statue of Athena Parthenos uh, in her kind of battle uh, garb here. And this is what's known as a Chris Elephantine statue, all right? So Chris uh, meaning gold, elephantine meaning ivory. And so the whole thing would have been this giant monumental statue of gold and ivory. And what's kind of cool here, right, is she's got her shield and she's got her spear and her helmet. She's got a little uh, image of the Gorgon Medusa, right? right on her, uh, her chest there. And then she's holding another Athena, right? So Athena Parthenos here, right, is holding a statue of Athena Nike, um, Athena, the goddess of victory. And again, we can see that marked by the, uh, the kind of wings coming off of this version of Athena holding a, um, uh, a laurel wreath or probably an olive uh, wreath here. And so this is a recreation actually from Nashville where they rebuilt the entire Parthenon. But we know that, uh, we kind of roughly know, even though we don't have the cult statue at all anymore, we kind of roughly know what it looks like. This is pretty cool. It's a mini miniature statue, right? So this statue in antiquity was so famous that people made copies of it, like tiny little copies that you could like take home with you. Imagine if you ever go to like the Colosseum, you can buy your little like toy Colosseum right outside of it or your little toy Parthenon. In antiquity, it was kind of the same. You could go buy a model of the statue of Athena. So the reason we have a rough sense for what this looked like is because we have little models of this. You know, this is only about three feet tall here uh, from antiquity, and this is like 40 feet tall or something. All right, now to finish off, we're gonna quickly run through the final building on the uh, Acropolis, and that's the Erechtheion, the one over right over here, right? The really weirdly shaped uh, temple. And this is kind of a, the, yeah, it's the strangest floor plan of any of the temples on the Acropolis. And if you remember back to last time, this is the site of Poseidon's trident strike into the Acropolis and Athena's olive tree. It also marks the burial place of the early leaders of Athens. So, right, remember Kekrops, half serpent, half man, uh, Erechtheus, and we'll hear about him in just a second. Uh, and then finally, it's very famous for uh, these sculptures right here known as Caryatids. And the Caryatids are uh, columns, right? They're actually structural columns supporting the roof here, uh, but have, they have been carved into these beautiful statues of, uh, of women. And here's another kind of picture, right, with the, uh, the, the olive tree, the gift of Athena. Now, the, the final thing I'm gonna talk about today uh, goes back to the founding of Athens, and this is where we get the uh, name, the Erechtheion. Um, and it begins with this really, really weird story. Some kind of nonsense is happening, and like, um, I somehow like Athena has ended up with the semen of either like Poseidon or Hephaestus, depending on which version you go with. Somehow something's happened and she ends up with this on her leg. And she's like, this is disgusting. <laughs> so she uses like a piece of wool from a, uh, like, you know, a, a sheep to wipe it off, throws it on the ground. I shouldn't just throw things like that on the ground. But because this is like divine, wiped up semen. It like somehow pairs with Gaia and like goes into the ground and then Gaia becomes pregnant. And out from the ground, uh, we get Eric Thonius, right? Uh, so there's this other kind of God, kind of like Kepcrops, not kind of, kind of mythical human kind of divine character, uh, born from the ground, okay? And then his descendant, Erechtheus, uh, becomes one of the first kings of Athens. So we have Kekrops, and then Erechthonius, and then Erechtheus, um, being some of these early kings uh, of Athens. 
Um, and that's where we get the name, the kind of weird name for that building, the Eric Theon, because it's marking the burial place um, of this kind of very early leader of Athens, this kind of semi-divine, uh, semi-mythical character. Um, and one of the things that this kind of relates to as well is this kind of like um, kind of almost virgin birth of Eric Thonius, right? He kind of just comes from the ground, right? With doesn't He's not produced from like a, a normal woman or something like that. Um, I, Athenians end up later using that as a way to justify their place socially in terms of the social hierarchy kind of ab above women. Um, and that's where they end up getting their kind of place in the public realm. Uh, whereas uh, women end up very much more in the, uh, the kind of private realm in Greek society. Okay, so, uh, sorry TAs, I went a little bit over there. I know that's my bad, that's my bad. But I want to turn it over to you, Darcy. Uh, feel free um, to, uh, to start leading us through where we are going from here with the project, a little bit about the final project, what they can expect, um, and go ahead and take it away. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, Dr. Rob. Um, so, okay, yeah, you guys just got done with the rough draft of your um, of your project. So it's a three-part project, as you know, uh, rough draft in the bag. It's already done. You don't have to worry about that. So I just wanted to just talk a little bit about the um, final draft of the research proposal. So you've got a little bit over a month to work on this. It's due November 13th. Um, that's a Friday, 11 o'clock, right before class. Uh, it'll be 750 to uh, 1500 words. And then it's, it's gonna be worth 10% of your grade. And remember, you need to use um, MLA, APA formatting. Um, yeah, so let's go ahead and move forward. Some of the differences between the rough draft and the, uh, the final proposal that you wanna pay attention to. So the rough draft basically is, is just you presenting all of the information that you're, you're interested in doing, right? Um, laying out the sort, some of the sources that you found, how those are potentially gonna be used, um, your question for research. So the final, the final draft needs to be really solid and well-considered. Um, have a clear understanding of what your topic is, what your topic question or your research question is, and how you're gonna put that all together. Um, and then in terms of your primary and secondary sources, now's the time that we wanna see what the conclusions are that you've made from uh, your research in those areas. How have they helped you answer your research question? Um, and then also just have a concrete explanation of why this topic matters. Why would the rest of us be curious about it? Um, and you know, what does it say about the broader Greek society or our society today? Um, so just start making those connections pretty clearly. And then finally, um, we're really interested in what you're gonna be doing for your final project. So we wanna see some clear guidelines about how you're gonna accomplish that last bit of the project. And in just a few minutes, Julianne will have a bit more information about that final project for you guys to start thinking and considering um, just more specifically how you wanna accomplish that. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. Uh, I just wanted to point out, uh, if you're not aware, there are some free uh, writing improvement um, possibilities here at the University of Arizona. So there's the Writing Skills Improvement Center. Um, and as you can see here, you can do 30 or 50 minutes long sessions. And it's just, you know, really at any level, it can help you with brainstorming, organizing um, your mechanics, your citations. So if you have any questions, go ahead and check out this website right here. And then there's also the University of Arizona Think Tank. And these are also free 15 minute drop-in sessions, or you can make an appointment and have a full 30 minute session. So that's also just another opportunity for you guys to really brush up on your writing, um, have, somebody, have somebody else taking a look at uh, your drafts and just giving you some pointers. So, all right, let's, uh, let's go ahead and move on to Julianne and we'll talk a little bit about the final project. Awesome. Okay, so this is a little bit more about the final project. Again, the draft that you just turned in and the um, proposal that Darcy talked about is all kind of 
um, leading up to the final project and you'll talk about the sources and what you're actually going to do for the final project, which should be a digital format. And again, this is all stuff that Colin uh, helpfully went over last week. So this is just a quick little review. Um, some options if you're stuck and you can't think of anything else, you could do a documentary. Um, you could do uh, an artistic creation with commentaries, so like a painting or something. And then the commentary could be a write-up edition that's explaining kind of what's going on in it. Um, flash animation video, NS paint animation, all other sorts of hand-drawn videos. You could do a funny historical recreation, graphic novel, travel brochure, website, and really anything else you could think of in a digital format that you think would be a good, fun way um, to express your research um, is something you can do. So uh, we pulled a couple of examples to kind of show you um, what these might look like. So if you could show, so this is an excerpt from a graphic novel and this is actually like a professionally published one. So don't feel like <laughs> you have to have a graphic novel that's this, but you can see it's depicting um, a scene here. So you could do sort of like a short little graphic novel excerpt where you depict um, I don't know, something from one of the myths or whatever your research project is about, you could do something like that. And again, this is published, so don't feel like it has to be like this. If you could go to the next slide. Um, so this is actually an example of a website. So you'll see here that they did it on um, the hippogra the hip Hippocrates, I can pronounce words, it's fine. Um, from 400 BC, you'll see at the top it says home, the oath, the four humors, illness list, cure, the Galen medicine and works cited. Um, so if you go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So this is what one of the um, tabs looks like. So you'll see that it has a quote. So it's engaging with the source. You'll see it has a short little write up about um, what this is. And so this is kind of um, what your website could look like. Maybe a couple tabs, a little bit of engagement with the source text, but it's not like you have to have extensive essays on each um, of the tabs, although you definitely could if you wanted to. And if you have a lot to say, then that's awesome. But um, yeah, if you could go to the next slide. So this is uh, an animation video or an example of one. Again, I believe this one was also professionally done. So <laughs> don't stress that it has to be uh, this quality. And we'll just watch a couple seconds, not too long, um, but just so you can kind of see. On Mount Olympus, the gods were debating whether Odysseus should return home. Eventually, Zeus decides Odysseus should return, so he sends Hermes, the messenger god, to tell Calypso to set Odysseus free. While the goddess Athena goes to Odysseus' son Telemachus to help him find out what happened to his father, because he and his mother's palace is being overrun with suitors after their fortune. Athena, in disguise, convinces him to go to Nestor, who fought with Odysseus in the Trojan War. Okay, I think that's a good place to... Okay, yeah, so you got, you got a couple seconds. You can kind of see uh, the video itself is a couple minutes long, so you have the opportunity to present more content. Um, but again, it could be something like this. And these are just a couple examples. Like I said, there's that first list of all your options. And even then, you could do something that's not listed on there. You really... We want this to be creative and fun, so really choose something that will be fun for you to do um, and you think will be a fun way to... Uh, well, present your project, yeah. So I think up next is attendance. Um, so go ahead, if you go on D2L, the color today is orange. Heracles is orange. Oh, someone raised their hand. Okay. So go ahead and do attendance. Come back in a few minutes.
All right, you guys. So now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Aeschylus's Eumenides and the extremely long list of uh, really horrible events that lead up to it. So I'm going to be throwing a lot of information at you really quickly, just so we have time to get through this. Um, not all of it is like that important for you to know. The actual play information is going to be sort of back-ended here. But um, so this play is obviously by Aeschylus. Uh, it's part of a trilogy, actually, that was performed around 458 BCE. And uh, the other two parts are Agamemnon and the Libation Bear Bearers. This is the third part of the trilogy. And its name means the Gracious Ones, which actually uh, refers to the Furies. And we're going to learn a bit about why that is in a minute. But for now, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so the history leading up to this is... Uh, it really just long and complex, and it has everything to do with this family that just is cursed and so many terrible things happen to them, but also it's kind of their own fault. So, I mean, you know, you reap what you sow, am I right? So Tantalus, I think we all remember that story. Uh, he tried to feed his son Pelops to the gods. The gods weren't super happy about this. So they uh, sent Tantalus down to the underworld to be punished for all eternity and they uh, revive Pelops. So he gets to just go about his business, um, but does he decide to just not bother anyone and mind his own business? No, he does not. <laughs> he uh, ends up coming across this woman, Hippoda Hippodamia, and he wants to marry her, but she's a princess and her father is King Oinamis. And uh, King Oinamis is like, okay, well you can marry her, but you have to beat me in a chariot race first. Uh, and Pelops doesn't want to leave this up to chance. So he gets a servant of the king, Myrtilus, to help him out with this and sabotage the king's chariot. But the king dies uh, from the sabotage in the chariot race. And so Pelops like technically wins and he gets to marry Hippodamia. But then to tie up loose ends, he also kills Myrtilus. And with his dying breath, Myrtilus curses Pelops' family uh, for the second time. So now they have two curses compounding. And... <laughs> things just really spiral out of control from there. He has two kids. Well, they have a lot of kids, but the most important ones are Thyestes and Atreus, uh, who are brothers, but they don't get along. They end up getting exiled to um, Mycenae because uh, in the one time they actually managed to work together, they killed their stepbrother, Chrysippus. <laughs> and yeah, so they end up on Mycenae and um, Atreus decides that he wants to give a sacrifice to Artemis. So he promises the best lamb from his flock uh, for the sacrifice, except uh, when, he, when he goes to look at his flock, he finds the best lamb is like golden, like it's shining and glistening. And he's like, well, actually, I want this lamb. <laughs> so he gives it to his wife, uh, Erope, to hide. And uh, she is in like a secret relationship with his brother, Thyestes. So she gives him the lamb. And then Thyestes is like, well whoever has the lamb should be king. And then Atreus stupidly agrees to this and Thyestes uh, becomes the king. Uh, until Atreus, with the help of Hermes and Zeus, uh, manages to take the throne back because he's like, well, when the sun moves backwards in the sky, I should be able to be king. And then Zeus does this for him and he becomes the king of the land. Um, and then Atreus learns that Thyestes was seeing his wife behind his back <laughs> and he decides that the best way to deal with this is to kill Thyestes' sons and feed them to him. Uh, then Thyestes gets banished for cannibalism, even though he wasn't aware that this was happening. And then Thyestes uh, is like, well, how do I get back at my brother for this? So he goes to an oracle, but the oracle tells him that he should have a son with his daughter. Uh, and the, but the daughter like eats the baby because she's like, I don't want any part of this situation. Uh, <laughs> and somehow Atreus ends up raising uh, his son Aegisthus, and you can see him down there in the family tree. Uh, and then Aegisthus grows up and kills Atreus, but not before Atreus has two sons, Menelaus and Agamemnon, who we briefly discussed during the uh, Trojan War, but if we go to the next slide, we can learn a little more about them. Yeah, so these two sons, they marry Helen and Clytemnestra. Uh, obviously, Menelaus marries Helen, and <laughs> that ends up uh, being sort of uh, what starts the Trojan War because of the whole Judgment of Paris situation. Helen gets taken, she's in Troy, and then they all decide, well, we have to go deal with this. Unfortunately, shortly before this situation, uh, Agamemnon decided to go and hunt in one of Artemis's sacred groves and killed one of the deer there. Uh, 
and then said, oh, I'm the best, I'm the best hunter. I'm better than Artemis, which is a really bad idea, but she doesn't react right away. She's like, I'm going to wait until the worst possible moment to get my revenge for that situation. And so when they're about to head out for Troy, she's, she's like, well, the winds aren't going to work. You can't sail anywhere. Like you're trapped and you can't go to war. Uh, and Agamemnon's like, well, how do I fix this? And an oracle tells him, another one of these oracles giving really sketchy advice, uh, you need to sacrifice one of your children. So he, <laughs> so he sacrifices his eldest daughter, Iphigenia. Uh, in some versions, she is act like she doesn't get killed because Artemis feels bad and like swaps her out last minute for a deer and everything is fine. But in the in Aeschylus's version, she is killed, which. Uh, Clytemnestra is not super happy about. Uh, they head off to war. Clytemnestra is enraged by this situation, as you might be if uh, your husband just killed one of your children. Uh, so let's head on to the next slide and see what happens. Okay, so we're fi we're finally at where the plays uh, <laughs> the plays begin. The first one, Agamemnon, is Agamemnon coming back from the war. Uh, he comes back with Cassandra, who's the prophet who's never believed, but she always tells the truth. Cassandra's like, this is not good. Like, we're both going to die basically immediately upon arriving. Agamemnon obviously doesn't believe her. They are both killed by Clytemnestra. Uh, and Aegisthus, who is now her lover, is like, yeah, this is great. Good job. This was, I helped plan this. <laughs> so uh, then we move on to the second part of the trilogy, which is the libation bearers. Orestes, who's another one of the children of Agamemnon, comes home and he meets up with his sister Electra. Uh, and Apollo is like, y'all need to get revenge. So <laughs> they work together and they kill Clytemnestra and Aegisthus. But the Furies do not like it when you kill a family member. Like that's like that's a big no-no. You cannot commit the crime of killing a family member. It didn't count when Clytemnestra killed um, Agamemnon because they were married and weren't uh, related. So... Yeah, that's not, that's not how that works. But Orestes gets the short end of the stick here. Uh, Clytemnestra's ghost eggs on the Furies. Uh, he manages to briefly escape because Apollo helps him out. And then we end up in the third part of the play, Eumenides, uh, where he asks for Athena to just sort of deal with the situation. And she ends up creating a courtroom. And this is sort of the foundation of the court of the Areopagus in Athens and just the, the rule of law over the rule of just the traditional manner of dealing out justice, which is just murdering everyone uh, who wrongs you, <clears throat> which, you know, doesn't really work if you're trying to keep your society organized. Uh, so yeah, she, she has this court case. They all, everyone presents their, their sides, the Furies on one side and Orestes on the other. And Orestes uh, ends up getting a split vote from the various jurors that she's picked up from the town. Uh, and then Athena gives the deciding vote for Orestes, and he wins the case. And now there's rule of law, and she renames the Furies the Eumenides because she's like, now you guys are going to be the gracious ones, and you're going to make sure actual justice is being dealt instead of just perpetuating this cycle of revenge that ends up uh, with an extremely high body count. All right, so I guess I'll uh, hand it over to Matt now. <laughs> All right, thank you. So uh, I'm going to be talking about the Persian Wars. And uh, like Dr. Rob said, this is kind of why the Parthenon and these, these other buildings were built, because Athens had been burned to the ground. So I'm going to give you a real bare bones structure of this. There is a ton of information on the Persian Wars, and you can find a lot of it online, books, yada, yada, yada. Um, so, yeah. Basically, how it starts is um, the Persians ended up conquering Lydia, which is today modern Turkey. And there's a lot of Greek colonies in Turkey. Um, and the Greeks, they don't like being conquered. They don't like any of their stuff. They don't like ru anybody ruling them but them. So they revolt. And uh, after a few victories, and they took the city of Sardis, the main city in the area, um, and they ended up burning it to the ground, um, or at least part of it in one of the major temples, which is why... Um, they end up burning Acropolis. And now you ask, why did they burn Acropolis? It's because the Athenians um, helped. So the Athenians were like, okay, we got colonies over there. We're going to help you guys. Um, they send troops. Um, they don't send that much. Uh, they're not that invested, but they do send some. Um, so yeah, the Persians eventually come in and they defeat uh, and put down the rebellion. And they actually conquer into uh, what is today Macedon and that area. So 
the Persians are under Darius first are upset. They're like, okay, uh, we had all this huge war. Um, Athens came at us and we need revenge. So basically what happens is they go down to Marathon. They lead a, a naval fleet down and they land at Marathon, which is kind of, it's kind of hard to see on this map, but basically it's like a little like north of Athens um, and on the coast. So the Persians and Greeks ended up meeting there. Uh, the Persian army uh, numbers are disputed, but it was probably about 9,000 uh, troops. 90, sorry, 90,000. And the Greeks themselves were fielding probably about 10 to, fi- 10 to 15,000. So they come in, and the Persians get out their ships. Uh, the Persians are real archer heavy, heavy and cavalry heavy, but their cavalry was actually pretty absent from this battle. Um, and kind of how it um, went was the Greeks lined up in the phalanx. I think Dr. Rob talked about it. It's basically a giant shield wall, several men deep. And there was actually a, a commander among Athens who had whose kingdom had been conquered. He was up near what is today like uh, Istanbul, uh, kind of on the Bosphorus. And um, he had this strategy where basically what he did was he thinned the middle line in the middle part of the line. So the Persians hit the middle, thinking that's where it's going to break, and they drove it back. The line stayed together, but it pushed back, and the flanks came and rounded out. And they just came and clashed in, and the Greeks annihilated the Persians. Um, They pushed them all the way back to the ships. Uh, Herodotus and some other people talk about how the Greeks were chopping off the hands of the Persians as they tried to um, scurry onto the ships. So... Persians win. I'm uh, sorry, the Greeks win. The Persians run back to per- Persia, um, in Asia Minor. And fun little fact for the Battle of Marathon is that is how we get the name for and the distance for a modern day marathon. They basically, after the Battle won, they sent a runner back to Athens, which is 28.3 miles or whatever the exact thing is for uh, a marathon. And the runner ran into Athens and yelled, Nike, victory. And supposedly he dropped dead after that. Uh, after he ran to the city from exhaustion. But yeah, so that's the big thing. So 10 years later or so, Persians are still pissed and Darius had died, his son. Xerxes came in. It's like, all right, I want revenge. But it's like, I'm not going to land at Marathon. That was a bad place. And I couldn't feel that many troops. So Xerxes amasses an absolutely massive army. Um, Herodotus, uh, the famous historian who was prone to exaggeration, said that the Persians fielded 2.5 million troops um, and then an equal number of support, cooks, attendants, stuff like that. Uh, So much so that it would drink entire rivers dry. Now, this is probably not true. Um, However, the army was still massive. Uh, They think conservative numbers about 200 to 300,000. So yeah, so they march down and they conquer their way in a little bit. They had already conquered Macedon in that area, and they get to a place called Thermopylae, which just means like like uh, like a hot spring. And there you meet a contingent of Greeks. Now the Greeks, uh, for the first time really forever, they come together and they're like, okay, we need to defend against Persia. So. They set up at Thermopylae. There's a small pass called the Hot Gates that they can sit in, get in their phalanx, and they can eliminate the Persian numbers. But there was festivals going on and stuff like that, so the Greeks ended up only uh, bringing in about six to 7,000 troops against an army of what was probably 200,000. But they were winning. Greeks were heavily trained. Um, they were armored head-to-toe hoplites. Um, these guys were literally walking tanks emphasis on the walking because they didn't move fast um and yeah so they managed to get in with the spartans 300 spartans under the one of the kings of sparta leonidas the first they spearheaded this and these guys were awesome uh spartans were trained uh from a young age to only do warfare they had helots slaves that did the rest of the work um unlike um Soldiers and hoplites from other places like Athens who were kind of citizen soldiers. They did other things in their spare time. But yeah, Spartans went through a massive training program called the Agogi. AJ, you're taken away from your family, put in with your local 
um, group and beaten, starved, left out in the wilderness, toughest troops there was. But yeah, Spartans and the Greeks hold out for three days, inflicting massive casualties on the Persians. And it's just it, the area and the terrain and the armament of the Greeks allowed them to really hold this area. So on the final day, though, third day, the local Greeks like, hey, I want some cash from Xerxes and comes in and tells Xerxes there's a path. So the Persians start to come around and Leonidas is like, all right, we're not making out of this. So he sends most of the army back, uh, his 300 and a few uh, Thespians and Thebans stay and they hold out to the to pretty much the last man. The Thebans end up defecting, but the Spartans hold out and fight to the last man. So uh, the rest of the army retreats to Corinth, and they end up beating the um, the Persians at a naval battle at Salamis, right around Athens, and then at Plataea in Boeotia. All right, that's all the time I have. Uh, if you want more information, just look online, or you can email me. I have tons of information. I have like three pages of notes on these. So uh, back to you, Dr. Rob. Oh, I totally forgot to do the slides. All right. Well, thank you guys. That was excellent. Um, if you guys want more information on things like the Persian Wars, uh, check out Meet the Ancients. We'll be talking a lot more about that. Um, with Agamemnon and his completely messed up family, uh, you're going to be hearing a lot more about that as the semester of this class um, rolls on. So especially kind of once we get into the heroes section after the midterm, um, that'll come up again and again and again. Uh, so you'll kind of solidify your understanding of, of that. Uh, narrative arc. Look, guys, have a great weekend. Congrats on getting your uh, your drafts of your research proposals in, and I will see you all on Monday. Bye, everyone.